Hi everyone, welcome again to the Basic Philippine Law and Jurisprudence channel. Uh, we are on the series of lectures on property and land law. Now we will discuss ownership. What is ownership? Ownership is that independent right of a person to the exclusive enjoyment and control of a thing, including its disposition and recovery, subject only to restrictions or limitations established by law and the rights of others. What is important to remember in ownership is that it is a series of rights as well as obligations. So when you're an owner of a thing or a right, uh, ownership best in you, certain rights. And uh, along with those rights, there are also limitations or restrictions uh, that are imposed on the owner of that thing or right. Okay, so what is the subject matter of ownership? As I've said, it can be a thing or a physical property such as a cell phone, a car, a uh, land, or it can be rights such, such as, for example, uh, the right to lease, uh, the right of first refusal, uh, and other incorporeal rights, intellectual property rights, for example. Okay, so it can be a thing or it can be a right. Now, as I've said, uh, there are certain rights conferred to the owner of the property. Now, what are these rights? Of course, when you're the owner of a property, you have the right to possess, the right to use and enjoy, the right to the fruits as an extension of your right of ownership, the right to the accessories also as an extension of your right of ownership, the right to consume the thing by its use, the right to dispose or to alienate, and the right to vindicate or recover. We will discuss in detail all, all of these rights when we go to uh, the succeeding chapters where we will discuss the right to possess, the right to the accession or to the fruits and accessories. In the meantime, we will discuss in this chapter the right to vindicate and the right to dispose or consume the property. Okay, which is the subject of ownership. Okay, as I have said, uh, the owner is conferred or vested not only with rights but also with limitations or restrictions on ownership. Not uh, just because you are the owner, it doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to do on your property. There are certain limitations or restrictions on the right of ownership. Uh, Foremost among those limitations is the one which are imposed by law, such as, for example, there are certain restrictions or limitations imposed by law, uh, example of which would be easements. Okay, there are easements which are created by law, those, those which are imposed by the inherent powers of the state, such as uh, police power, taxation, and eminent domain. Just because you are the owner of the property, for example, your salary, you don't have the right to use or dispose all of your salary because the government can impose taxes thereon and you're obliged to pay your taxes. So in that way, there is a limitation on your right of ownership. Taxation becomes a limitation. In the same power, in, in the same manner, eminent domain, for example, which is an inherent power of the state, uh, affects your right to dispose your property. Because even if you don't want to dispose your property, if the government needs it for a public purpose, as long as the government pays just compensation for the said property, you will be compelled to dispose of that property even if you don't want it. So in a way, it is also a limitation or restriction on your right of ownership. The okay, easement or servitude. Easement or servitude can either be imposed by law or by contract. You have the easement of, uh, there is a certain height if you are um, 
within the the flying zone or near if you if you have a lot or a property near the airport there are certain area limitations imposed by aerial navigation uh, by which you cannot uh, uh, there is a certain limitation on the height of buildings that can be uh, constructed in the said area so <clears throat> in a way it is also a restriction or a limitation on ownership Article 427 tells us about the uh, objects or subjects of ownership. As I have said a while ago, ownership may be exercised over things or over rights. Now, there are two kinds of ownership, one of which is naked ownership. When we speak of naked ownership, it means legal title or registered ownership. So, uh, the uh, most basic example in this case is a land. Uh, if you are the registered owner of a land, you are the you have naked ownership or legal title. On the other hand, if you do not have a title on a land, but you have uh, been uh, exercising open, notorious, exclusive possession uh, of the said. Uh, parcel of land for the required period of time necessary to vest ownership through acquisitive per prescription, then it, it may be said that you have beneficial ownership or equitable title. It is the ownership recognized by law and capable of being enforced in the courts at the suit of the beneficial owner. So it was defined in Black's Law Dictionary as uh, it is the interest of a beneficiary in trust property, also called equitable ownership. And second, it may refer to the power of a corporate sh shareholder to buy or sell the shares, to, though the shareholder is not registered in the corporation's books as the owner. So um, even if the legal title is not vested in the beneficial owner, the law, best in him beneficial ownership if he has been in possession of the said property in open, notorious, exclusive, continuous uh, possession within the required period necessary to vest ownership by acquisitive prescription, then he is the beneficial owner and he may assert the said ownership even against one who has fraudulently secured legal title over the same property. So that is beneficial ownership. Okay. Now we proceed to the jurisprudence relevant to our topic on ownership. We have the case of Distilleria Washington versus Court of Appeals. So this is actually a replevin suit which was filed by La Tondena Incorporated to uh, recover the white clint bottles bearing the marks of La Tondena Incorporated and Ginebra, Ginebra San Miguel. Remember the gin bottles were in the, the trademark of Ginebra San Miguel were all embossed or imprinted in the said bottle. Now La Tondena asserted that it is the owner and registrant of the bottles. So it was entitled to the protection uh, under Republic Act 623. So in order to recover those bottles which were in the possession uh, of uh, the uh, respondent, uh, it uh, filed a replevin suit. Now, uh, as you all know, uh, because according to La, uh, La Tondena, it is the owner of the bottles. Therefore, even if it has already uh, uh, parted or sold the gin product, okay, the bottle allegedly uh, still belongs to them. So the Supreme Court uh, stated that uh, it is basically an intellectual creation that is susceptible to ownership and consistently gives right to its own elements of jus possidenti 
jus utendi, jus proendi, jus disponendi, and jus abutendi, along with the applicable jus lex. So it cannot be gainsaid that ownership of the containers thus pass on to the consumer, albeit subject to the statutory limitations on the use of the registered containers and to the trademark rights of the registrant. So in effect, uh, the Supreme Court said that the manufacturers sell the product in marked containers through dealers to the public in supermarkets, grocery shops, retail stores, and other sales outlets. The buyer takes the item. He is neither required to return the bottle nor required to make a deposit to assure its return to the seller. So he could return the bottle and get a refund. A number of bottles at times find their way to commercial users. So in effect, the Supreme Court said that the trademark rights of uh, La Tondena, okay, uh, enjoy special protection. However, the physical ownership of the bottles are passed on to the consumers, subject to special protection on their trademark rights. So in this case, the, the court said that the court sees no other logical purpose for petitioners' insistence to keep the bottles because they are getting the bottles through a suit for replevin. The practical and feasible alternative is to merely require the payment of just compensation to petitioner for the bottles seized from it by La Tondena. Conventional wisdom along with equity and justice to both parties takes it. So, since physical ownership of the bottles uh, are already not with La Tondena once they sell the products, Okay, it is uh, but, but just that just compensation be granted to the post to the respondent who now possesses or who presently possesses the said bottles. Okay, now we proceed to the case of residents of Lower Atab versus Santa Monica. So this case distinguishes between legal title as well as beneficial title. The petitioners in this case are residents of Lower Atab and Teachers Village. They filed a case for quieting of title uh, of a certain parcel of land. Okay, The respondent in this case began to erect a fence on the subject property, claiming that it is the owner of a large portion thereof because he has a transfer certificate of title. So in this case, the Supreme Court uh, found it uh, opportune to distinguish uh, what is legal title from equitable or beneficial title. Legal title denotes registered ownership, while equitable title means beneficial ownership. Beneficial ownership has been defined as ownership recognized by law and capable of being enforced in the courts at the suit of the beneficial owner. Petitioners do not have legal or equitable title to the subject property. Evidently, there are no certificates of title in their respective names. However, they applied for the purchase of the property from the government through town site sales applications course through the DNR. By stating that they were in the process of applying to purchase the subject property from the government, they admitted that they had no such equitable title at the very least which should allow them to prosecute a case for quieting of title because one of the requisites for a case of quieting of title to prosper is that you have legal or equitable ownership so either legal ownership or beneficial ownership so in this case considering that they have not satisfied the first requirement of legal an equitable title to the subject property, quieting of title case cannot prosper. Okay, Magat versus Court of Appeals. So, in this case, Basilisa executed a deed of donation over a parcel of residential land in favor of her four children. Uh, thereafter, she executed a deed of absolute sale of the house and lot in favor of the petitioner. 
So the respondents filed an action against the petitioner for annulment of the transfer certificate of title. Uh, it is his contention that when the deed of donation provides that the donor will not dispose or take away the property donated, he is in effect making a donation in terms He parts away with his naked title but maintains beneficial ownership while he lives. So in this case, there was already a disposition of the property through a donation in terms However, the beneficial ownership or the use of rock or the use of the property remained with the donor. Okay? So it is actually uh, the possession is with the donor, but the naked ownership or legal title is with the donor. Okay? So there is a reservation of the right to use. So the prohibition to alienate does not necessarily defeat the inter vivos character of the donation, it even highlights the fact that what remains with the donor is the right of use of rock and not anymore the naked title of ownership. So the prohibition on the donor to alienate the said property during her lifetime is proof that naked ownership over the property has been transferred to the donors. She has already divested herself of the right to dispose the donated property. The donees were already the owners of the subject property due to the irrevocable character of the donation. Okay, so this is uh, a case wherein the right to possess or use the property is separate and distinct from the naked ownership because the donee has reserved his or her right to possess or use the property while he is still alive, but he has already disposed or alienated the said property by way of donation. Okay. Okay, we now come to one of the attributes of the right of ownership, which is the right to possess, use, or to dispose or recover property. Article 428 tells us that the owner has the right to enjoy and dispose of a thing without other limitations than those established by law. The owner has also a right of action against the holder and possessor of the thing in order to recover it. So we are talking here, Article 428 talks of three rights. Okay, first is the right to enjoy or to possess. Second is the right to dispose or to alienate. Third is the right to vindicate the property against the holder or possessor of the thing. Okay. Now, we, we will now go first to the right to vindicate or to recover property. There are actually three remedial actions that are used in order for a person, for the owner of a property, to recover possession of real property. The first is action interdict. What is action interdictal? Okay, it is a summary proceeding which may either be for forcible entry or for unlawful det detainer. Okay, it is used for the recovery of physical or material possession where the dispossession has not lasted more than one year and should be brought in the proper interior court. Okay, remember that the issue in action interdictal is only physical or material possession, okay? Uh, not based on ownership, ha? but who is the present or who, who is the one in prior physical possession, okay? And then the second one is action publishana, the plenary action to recover the better right of possession, which should be brought in the proper inferior court or RTC, uh, when the dispossession has lasted for more than one year. So if, for example, you have a forcible entry or unlawful detainer case, but the demand from the date of demand or the dispossession has lasted for more than one year, so you, you, you cannot file anymore an action interdictal. So what you will file 
is an action of Mishana or the plenary action to recover possession. Okay? Uh, and also, if uh, the, the uh, reason for this possession is not due to force, intimidation, okay, violence or threat, it is due to some other reason, okay, then uh, it would not fall in interdictal, but what you should do, do is you file an action publishana. Okay, the third one is action reinvidicatoria or reinvidicatory action. Okay, it is an action to recover real property based on ownership. Okay, again, it must be brought in the MTC or the RTC depending on the value of the property. Okay? The case of MMTC versus DMCI. So in this case, DMCI availed of the program for lease purchase agreement okay, with MMTC for the acquisition of buses. Now, it is in the agreement that pending full payment of the monthly installments, uh, they will be treated as rentals. So, it is a purchase of buses on installments. Uh, it is further agreed that in case of default in the installments, DMCI will take immediate possession of all the buses. Okay, so... Since the LPA or the Lease Purchase Agreement is the uh, contract voluntarily agreed upon by the parties, it is the law between them. So under the law, the right to possess is a necessary incident of ownership. <laughs> However, the owner cannot exercise this right to the prejudice of a party whose possession is predicated on a contract like agency, trust, pledge, or lease. So remember in this case, pending the payment of the purchase price, um, DMCI is actually the lessee of the buses. Okay, so if it uh, defaults in the payment of uh, the installments that are required, then uh, MMTC can take over the said buses. <clears throat> Under the LPA between MMTC and the MCI, the latter as lessee had a right of possession over the buses and it may be deprived of said right only if it failed to pay its dues for three consecutive months. Both the trial court and the appellate court established that there was actually no default on the part of uh, the MCI. So every possessor has a right to be respected in his possession and if deprived of such right, the law shall restore it to him. So in this case, one of the attributes of ownership, the right to possess or to enjoy the property has been granted to the lessee. And therefore, the lessee has the right to assert the possession of the said property even against the lawful owner thereof. So in this case, there was it was not established that BMCI defaulted in its obligations. Okay, in the case of Rojas versus Court of Appeals, so can a lease be considered as an alienation or uh, of the property? So the case of Rojas versus Court of Appeals tells us that okay, the word alienation means the transfer of the property and the possession of lands, tenements, or other things from one person to another. On the other hand, an encumbrance is defined as a right, interest in the land which may subsist in third persons to so the diminution of the value of the land but consistent with the passing of the fee by the conveyance, any act that impairs the use or transfer of property or real estate. So the issue is whether or not a lease is an encumbrance and or alienation. So under the civil code in the lease of things, one of the parties binds himself to give, to give another 
the enjoyment or use of the thing for a price certain and for a period which may be definite or indefinite. So under the law, lease is a grant of use and possession. So in the contract of lease, the lessor transfers his right of use in favor of the lessee. The lessor's right of use is impaired. Lease is a burden on the land. It is an encumbrance on the land. So the con concept of encumbrance includes lease. So lease is not only an encumbrance, but also a qualified alienation, with the lessee becoming, for all legal intents and purposes, and subject to its terms, the owner of the thing affected by the lease. So it is in effect, you are in effect selling your right to possess or use the property. That is meant what that is what is meant by qualified alienation. So the court held that the joinder of the wife, although unnecessary for an oral lease of conjugal realty, which does not exceed one year, is required in a lease of conjugal realty for a period of more than one year. Okay, because uh the Supreme Court has to distinguish between acts of administration and acts of alienation. Okay, so lease has been considered as a qualified alienation. So if it is more than one year, it has to be uh, the shared consent of both the spouses. Okay, Habon versus Alo. So in this case, Saturnino filed an action against Habon praying that he be declared owner of a parcel of land. Defendants, on the other hand, prayed that Habon be declared owner of the same property. So the trial court declared Habon as the owner of the portion of the land. And the decision has become final. So the decision which appears, uh, the decision in the decision, the court merely declares the plaintiff owner of the portions of the land under litigation. It does not give the plaintiff any other relief, much less it orders plaintiff to be placed in possession of the land adjudicated to him. So the question now that arises is whether that decision, which has become final and executory more than a year ago, can still be amended by adding there to a relief not originally included such as the delivery of the possession of the land and the ejectment therefrom of the defendants. Okay, remember, in this case, the Supreme Court distinguished between ownership and possession. So in the decision, it was declared that Habon was the owner, but it did not order that he be placed in possession. Now, Habon is arguing that possession is considered as an attribute of ownership. Thus, it necessarily follows that if you are the owner, you are necessarily entitled to possession. However, the Supreme Court said ownership is different from possession. So a person may be declared owner, but he may not be entitled to possession. So the possession may be in the hands of another, such as a lessee or a tenant. We therefore hold that a judgment for ownership does not necessarily include possession as a necessary instrument. So it doesn't mean that if you're a judge, the owner, you're automatically entitled to possession because there are a lot of cases wherein the right to possess or to enjoy the property is being held by another person, such as a lessee, for example, or a use of property. Heirs of Soriano versus Court of Appeals may a winning party in a land registration case effectively eject the possessor thereof whose security of tenure rights are still pending the termination before the DARAP. Okay, again, the Supreme Court uh, found the occasion to distinguish between possession and ownership, just like the previous case of Habon. Okay, possession and ownership are distinct legal concepts. Ownership confers certain rights to the owner, among which are the right to enjoy the thing owned 
and the right to exclude other persons from the possession thereof. On the other hand, possession is defined as the holding of a thing or the enjoyment of a right. So literally, to possess means to actually and physically occupy a thing with or without right. So a person may be declared owner, but he may not be entitled to possession. The possession may be in the hands of another, either a lessee or a tenant. A judgment of ownership, therefore, does not necessarily include possession as a necessary incident. So there is no dispute that private respondents' title over the land under litigation has been confirmed with finality. However, such declaration pertains only to ownership and does not automatically include possession, especially so in the instant case where there is a third party occupying the said land, allegedly in the concept of an agricultural tenant. While the issue of ownership has been laid to rest in the final judgment of the Land Registration Court, the right of possession is still controverted. This is precisely what is in issue in the security of tenure case filed with the DARAP. So it is important to note that although private respondents have been declared titled owners of the subject land, the exercise of their rights of ownership are subject to limitations that may be imposed by law. Remember what I told you? Uh, ownership has certain limitations. So if you are declared the owner of the property, there are certain limitations which are imposed by law, by the inherent powers of the state, or by easement. So this is one of those which are imposed by law. So what is that law? The Tenancy Act. Okay, agricultural lessees are entitled to security of tenure and they have the right to work on their respective land holdings once the leasehold relationship is established. So it doesn't mean that when the court declared that you are the owner of a certain property, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are automatically entitled to the possession thereof because there are certain limitations such as in this case, if it is established in the Dara proceedings that he is entitled to the possession of the property because of the leasehold relationship, then you must the owner must respect the same because it is one of the limitations which is established by law. Okay, we now proceed to the case of Culiado versus Gutierrez. So in this case, uh a title was issued in Gutierrez's paper. Culiado had been squatting on the parcel of land and he refused to vacate the realty despite the land. So Culiado, in his answer, argued of his actual possession and cultivation of the realty. The regional trial court decided in favor of Culiado and ordered Gutierrez to reconvey the realty. So, in this case, the Supreme Court found it opportune to distinguish between the different remedial uh, actions which are available to recover real property, the right to vindicate possession of real property. So, the judgment rendered in an action for forcible entry or unlawful detainer is conclusive only with respect to possession. As I have told you, to the to the uh, 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 to the in danger of being repetitious, okay. Uh, with respect to action interdictal, forcible entry and unlawful detainer cases, uh, the only issue in the said cases refer to material possession only. Okay, it will not bind the title or affect the ownership of the land or building and will not bar an action between the same parties respecting the title to the land or building. So when the issue of ownership is raised by the defendant in his pleadings, and the question of possession cannot be resolved without deciding the issue of ownership, the issue of ownership shall be resolved only to determine the issue of possession. So, when the issue of ownership is raised by the defendant, again, 
uh, in a case for unlawful detainer or forcible entry, it will be resolved by the court provisionally only because ownership is not an issue in forcible entry and unlawful detainer cases. The only issue in the said cases is physical or material possession. But if ownership has to be determined in order to determine who is entitled to the rightful possession of a parcel of land, then the court can proceed only provisionally, only for the purpose of determining who is the one uh, who, ha who should have possession of the real. Okay? However, in an action, Rebindicatoria, the cause of action of the plaintiff is to recover possession by virtue of ownership. Okay, Justin Di Candy, uh, the owner also has a right of action against the holder and possessor of the thing in order to recover it. In ordinary ejectment suits, the certificate of title is never in peril because the decision of the ejectment court on the issue of ownership is merely provisional. Always remember that in action interdictal cases, the determination of ownership is only provisional in nature. So, in however, in a rain dedicatory suit where the title or certificate of title is the basis of the cause of action, there is always a direct attack on the certificate of title. So, the moment the defendant disputes its validity in a counterclaim. In an action publishana, okay, this is an ordinary civil proceeding to determine the better right of possession, independently also of title. So both in publishana and in perdictal, the only issue there is material possession. The issue of ownership when necessary to determine the issue of possession will only be resolved provisionally without prejudice to the filing of another action later on, okay, as to possession based on ownership or a reinvitigatory action. It also refers to an ejectment suit filed after the expiration of one year from the approval of the cause of action. So in this case of Poliado, while the RTC could have resolved the issue of ownership provisionally, to determine the better right of possession, uh, which is allowed in an action publishana, it was without any power or jurisdiction to order the reconveyance of the land in dispute because that can be done only upon a definitive ruling on the said issue, something that cannot be done in an action publishana. Because in this case, the court ordered the reconveyance of the property, even if the only issue in this case is material possession or physical possession, because that is the only issue in Publishana cases. So it, has, it is bereft of any jurisdiction or power to order the reconveyance, because if you will order the reconveyance of property, it is in effect a determination of ownership permanent permanently and not on a provisional basis. So you can only determine uh, ownership provisionally in publishana and in interdictal cases. Okay? Because the only issue in the said cases, to repeat, is only material or physical possession of the property. Okay? Senpo et versus Martinez. In this case, Sophia was the registered owner of two parcels of land, which she leased to Senpoe. So while the lease was subsisting, Sophia sold the lots to her daughter, Jodora. Senpoe filed a complaint against Jodora for the annulment of the deed of sale executed by her mother in favor of, uh, executed by her mother, Sophia, in favor of Jodora. So uh, the uh, Senpoek was invoking his right of first refusal because according to Senpoek, when he entered into a lease of agreement with Sophia, 
it was also agreed upon between them that if the property will be sold, he will have the right of first refusal. So Chadora sold the property to Juanito. So the complaint was amended also to nullify the second sale transaction. So uh, the first sale, the Supreme Court held that the first sale between mother and daughter was void for being fictitious. Because if Chodora was really the owner of the lease premises as transferi bendi, she should have signed in that capacity and not merely as an instrumental. Chodora never asserted her right of ownership over the lease premises. Although Chodora had no authority to sell the entire lot, uh, rendering the sale unenforceable having been entered into by Chadora in behalf of her co-heirs, who did not give authority or legal representation, such contract is susceptible of ratification. So in order that a grant of right of first refusal may be enforceable, the same must be embodied in a written contract, unlike in the present case where the petitioner claimed that Chadora herself assured that they can have first priority to buy the subject parcels of land. But there was absolutely no proof of this. So in other words, it is only an alleged uh, oral assurance on the part of Chodora uh, to assure the lessee that in case he will sell, she will sell the property, uh, she, will she will first be informed, the lessee will be informed, and he had the right of first refusal. So in effect, it is it does not constitute a valid restriction on the right of the owner to dispose of his property because it did not comply with the formalities which were required by law. Because in order for a right of persecution refusal to be valid, it must be in a written contract. It must be reduced to writing. Okay, mga sir versus kutay. So in this case, mga sir filed a complaint for forcible entry. Um, respondent um, stealthily intruded and occupied a portion of his property by constructing a residential house thereon. Again, the Supreme Court said there is only one issue in ejectment proceedings. Who is entitled to the physical or material possession of the premises? That is possession de facto. Possession in forcible entry suits refers to nothing more than prior physical possession or possession de facto, not possession de jure or legal possession. So it is sufficient that petitioner was able to subject the property to the action of his will. The respondent failed to show that he falls under any of these circumstances. So the petitioner acquired possession of the subject property by juridical act, specifically to the issuance of a patent. So the issue of ownership should be provisionally determined. Apparently, the Torrance title suggests ownership over the land. Respondent also asserts ownership over the land based on his prior actual continuous public, notorious, exclusive, and peaceful possession. Because there are conflicting claims of ownership, then it is proper to provisionally determine the issue of ownership to settle the issue of possession de facto. Okay, remember in this case, one is asserting beneficial or equitable ownership, the other is asserting legal ownership. So who is entitled to the possession of the property, considering that both parties were asserting ownership over the real property. So the issuance of an original certificate of title to the petitioner evidences ownership and from it a right to the possession of the property. A person was a torrent's title over the property is entitled to the possession thereof. However, you must remember that uh, the uh, determination of um, the issue of ownership in the said case is only provisional in nature. Okay? Because it is um, 
a complaint for forcible entry. Okay? With, that is without prejudice to the filing of a reinvindicatory action wherein the possession is based on ownership. Okay? In, 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 in reinvindicatory action, the uh, court can make a, uh, not a provisional, but uh, a definite determination of who is really the owner of the real okay and from which ownership possession necessary flows okay Javier versus Berigiano so in this case petitioner instituted a complaint for forcible entry which was dismissed and the, the dismissal became final and executory petitioner was issued an original certificate of title. However, the previous defendant sold the realty to Rosette, who refused to surrender the same. Thus, petitioner filed a complaint for quieting of title and recovery of possession. Okay? Petitioner contends that res judicata cannot apply because there is no identity of causes of action since the first case was for forcible entry which is merely concerned with the possession of property, whereas the subsequent case was for quieting of title, which looks into the ownership of the disputed land. Okay, again, we go back to uh, our previous cases in which uh, the Supreme Court said that in forcible entry or interdictal and publishana cases, the only issue there is physical or material possession, while in Bring dedicatory action cases, like, for example, cases for annulment of title, cases for reconveyance. The issue there is ownership, okay? Where possession necessarily flows as an attribute of ownership, okay? So, a judgment rendered in a case for recovery of possession is conclusive only on the question of possession and not on the ownership. It does not in any way bind the title or affect the ownership of the land or building. So an action for quieting of title and recovery of possession is in reality an action to recover a parcel of land or an action re vindicatoria. Action re vindicatoria is thus an action whereby the plaintiff alleges ownership over a parcel of land and seeks recovery of its full possession. So it is different from interdictal or publishana where plaintiff merely alleges proof of a better right to possess. A judgment in forcible entry or detainer cases disposes of no other issue than possession and declares only who has the right of possession, but by no means constitute a bar to an action for determination of who has the right or title of ownership. So remember, the issues or the subject matter in Publishana and forcible entry as opposed to revindicatory actions are different. Okay, in interdictal and Publishana, the only issue is material possession. In revindicatory actions such as one for quieting of title, for conveyance or annulment of title, the issue there is ownership from which possession necessarily follows as its attribute. Okay. We have the case of Reyes versus Manalo. In this case, Reyes filed a complaint for a lawful detainer, which is an interdictal case. According to Victoria, her family tolerated the respondent's use and possession of the property, subject to the understanding that in the event that they need the same, the occupants would vacate. Here, Victoria elected to file an action for a lawful detainer claiming to be the owner of the subject property. A parasol of Victoria's complaint, however, would show her failure to prove the necessary jurisdictional facts of how and when the respondents entered the subject property, as well as how and when her family tolerated said respondent's possession. There was no clear allegation as to how the entry of respondents was affected as well as to how and when the dispossession started. Remember that these facts are very material in interdictal cases. 
Okay, because in forcible entry, you have to state how the uh, defendants were able to obtain possession of the property. Is it through force, intimidation, threat, strategy, or stealth? Okay, and in case of unlawful detainer, okay, you must also state how and when the dispossession started. So if it is by mere tolerance, okay, you have to state the circumstances under which, okay, you have tolerated the uh, possession of the said property by the defendant. In fact, tolerance is of utmost importance in an action for unlawful detainer. Tolerance cannot be presumed from the owner's failure to eject the occupants from the land. Rather, tolerance always carries with it permission and not merely silence or inaction. For silence or inaction is negligence, not tolerance. When the complaint fails to aver the facts constitutive of forcible entry or unlawful detainer, as where it does not state how entry was affected or how and when this possession started, the remedy should either be an action publishana or an action revindi okay, Action publishana meaning a plenary action to recover possession or revindicatoria, which is an action to recover possession based on ownership. Okay, Bernabe versus Dairi. In this case, Bernabe filed a complaint in the RTC against Tamayo to vacate their lot covered by Torrens title in their names and remove his illegally constructed house there. So in this case, uh, the Supreme Court said that it is not a forcible entry case. Action Publishana is also used to refer to an ejectment suit, which is filed after the expiration of one year from the approval of the cause of action, or from the date the lessee began to unlawfully hold possession of the real. In fact, Action Publishana is a catch-all or a basket for all the other instances of unlawful withholding of possession, which does not fall within any one of the causes provided for forcible entry, such as force, intimidation, threat, strategy, or stealth. If the cause of this possession is other than those force, intimidation, threat, strategy, or stealth, then your cause of action would not be for forcible entry, but a plenary action to recover possession. Okay, or if uh, the uh, suit was filed after the expiration of one year from the time that your cause of action accrued, even if it is through any one of those causes, even if it is through force, intimidation, threat, strategy, or stealth, you will not no, you can no longer avail of an action interdictal, but you can avail of a plenary action to recover possession or an action omission. Okay, BA Finance versus Court of Appeals. Okay, this is a suit for replevin. Okay, diba, uh, uh, as I've said, when it comes to real property, the uh, remedial actions which are available. To the owner are three, interdictal, publishana, revindicatory action. However, with respect to personal properties, what, what is the action or what is the remedy which is available to the owner in order to recover possession of a personal property? In this case, you have replevin. Okay, what is replevin? Okay, it is a form of principal remedy. And it is also a provisional relief. It, uh, the remedy is available to regain the possession of personal chattels being wrongfully detained from the plaintiff by another or to the provisional remedy that would allow the plaintiff to retain the thing during the pendency of the action and hold it pendentally. 
So the action is primarily possessory in nature and generally determines nothing more than the right of possession. So consequently, the person in possession of the property sought to be replevit is ordinarily the proper and only necessary party dependent. And the plaintiff is not required to join as dependents other persons claiming a right on the property but not in possession there. Okay, so the issue in the case of BA finance is where the right of the plaintiff to the possession of the specific property is so conceded or evident, the action need only be maintained against him who so possesses the property. Since the mortgage's right of possession is conditioned upon the actual fact of default, which itself may be converted, the inclusion of other parties like the debtor or the mortgager himself may be required in order to allow a full and conclusive determination of the case. When the mortgagee seeks a replevin in order to effect the eventual foreclosure of the mortgage, it is not only the existence of but also the mortgagee's default on the chattel mortgage that among other things can properly uphold the right to replevin the property. An adverse possessor who is not the mortgagor cannot just be deprived of his possession, let alone be bound by the terms of the chattel mortgage contract simply because the mortgagee brings up an action for record. Okay. The conveyance action. Article 433 and 434 tells us actual possession under a claim of ownership raises a disputable presumption of ownership. The true owner must resort to judicial process for the recovery of the property. So the term judicial process contemplates an ejectment suit or a reindicatory action. In an action to recover, the property may, must be identified and the plaintiff must rely on the strength of his title and not on the weakness of the defendant's claim. Okay, diba? As I told you before, in uh, interdictal and uh, publishana cases, the only issue here is material or physical possession. Okay, we're not talking of ownership. So whoever can establish prior physical possession has the right to the possession of the property. Why is that? Because of Article 4.3. What does Article 433 again tells us? Actual possession under claim of ownership. So you don't necessarily have to have title, legal title. Okay? Because if you are in possession of the property, you're claiming ownership of the property, you automatically enjoy disputable presumption of ownership. And whoever wants to have possession of the property that you are currently staying in, okay, he must have to go to court, file an action in court, okay, either any of the remedial actions that I have told you, interdictal, publishana, or indicatory action, so that he can recover possession of the real. He cannot take the law hands because he enjoys disputable presumption of ownership. Okay? And what must you prove in your action to recover the property? First, you must identify the property, the technical description of the property, and you must rely on the strength of your title. Whether that title be equitable or legal, you must rely or prove that you're really the owner of the property, and you must not rely on the witness of the defendant's claim. You must establish by your own evidence that you are entitled to the possession of the said property either by beneficial or legal title. Okay, Rosario versus Rosario. So in this case, Hippolyto was the owner of a certain parcel of land. He appointed Partenio, the defendant's father, as trustee 
but said trustee registered the same the said land in his own name without the knowledge and consent of his principal Hippolyto. So even granting that there was a breach of trust, reconveyance of the land could no longer be made because the land has already passed to the hands of innocent purchasers for value. The last vendies being the dependents who happened to be the children of the original registered owner. So the action for reconveyance is an equitable remedy available only when the parcel of land wrongly registered under the torrent system in the name of one who is not the owner and has not passed to the hands of an innocent purchaser or value. Jackson versus Kabatingan. Um, in an action for a conveyance, there are two things that you have to prove. First is the identity of the land. Second is the strength of your own title. So in the case of Jackson versus Sabatingan, the petitioner failed to identify the land, which is the subject matter of the case. And thus her claim has no leg to stand. An action revindicatoria is an action to recover ownership over real property. Article 434 provides that to successfully maintain an action to recover ownership, you must prove the identity of the land by describing the location, area, and boundaries thereof, and second, his title there. So Article 434 of the Civil Code requires identity of the land is the foremost relevant fact or issue to be determined in any action involving real properties. Unfortunately, petitioner failed to properly and sufficiently identify the subject property which she claims to have possessed and owned by her and her predecessors in interest. Accordingly, all other issues become futile. Okay? Article 429 speaks of um, the right to exclusive enjoyment. Okay? The owner or lawful possessor of a thing has the right to exclude any person from the enjoyment and disposal thereof. For this purpose, he may use such force, which is reasonably necessary to repel or prevent an actual or threatened unlawful physical invasion or usurpation of his property. Article 430 also tells us that Every owner may enclose or fence his land or tenements by means of walls, ditches, live or dead hedges, or by any other means without detriment to servitudes constituted there. Okay, if you are the owner of the property, you have the right to possess and use the property to the exclusion of all the others. Okay, what if there are others who are threatening okay, uh, to deprive you of the possession thereof, okay, you can invoke Article 429, which is the principle of self-defense or the principle of self-help with respect to property. Now, what are the requirements of the principle of self-help? The one depending is the owner or lawful possessor of the property. So, you must be the owner or the lawful possessor. Okay? What is meant by lawful possessor? You can be the lessee, you can be the use of property, not necessarily the owner. Or you can be the beneficial owner or the legal owner. The force that was used was reasonably necessary to prevent or repel the invasion or usurpation of the property. So, you cannot use force which is excessive, okay? You can only use force that is reasonably necessary. You cannot be the aggressor, okay? You can only defend your property. Okay? There must be no delay. The third requirement, there must be no delay between the onset of the invasion or usurpation and the use of reasonable force. If there is delay, between the invasion or usurpation, 
And the time when you invoke the principle of self-help, that can no longer be your job to go to the court if there is a gap between those two. Okay, German management versus court of appeal. So in this case, the spouses who say are the owners of a parcel of land. Now they authorize the petitioner, German management, to develop their property. So when, when German services went to the property, they discovered that there are occupants in the property of spouses who say. So German management advised the occupant to vacate, but they refused. So what German management did was they forcibly removed and destroyed the, the barbed wire fence and closing their farm holdings without notice, and bulldoze the crops that are planted on the said property. Now, uh, the issue is whether or not the private respondents are entitled to file a forcible entry case against the petitioner. So remember that uh, what uh, the private respondents or the present occupants of the property did was to file a forcible entry case against the legal owners of the property, which is the spouses who say. Notwithstanding petitioners claim that it was duly authorized by the owners to develop the subject property, private respondents as actual possessors can commence a forcible entry case against petitioner because ownership is not an issue. Forcible entry is merely a quieting process and never determines the actual title to an estate. Title is not in play. It is undisputed that at the time petitioner entered the property, private respondents were already in possession thereof. There is no evidence that the spouses who say were ever in possession of the subject property. Regardless of the actual condition of the title to the property, the party in peaceable, quiet possession shall not be turned out by its strong hand, violence, or terror. A party who can prove prior possession can recover such possession even against the owner himself. Whatever may be the character of his prior possession, if he has in his favor priority in time, he has the security that entitles him to remain on the property, until he is lawfully ejected by a person having a better right by action publiciana or reivindicatoria. So the doctrine of self-help can only be exercised at the time of actual or threatened dispossession, which is absent in the case at bar. When possession has already been lost, the owner must resort to judicial process for the recovery of the property. So, the principle of self-help cannot be applied to this case. Why? Because there was no, the, the uh, lawful owner or the legal owner has not been in possession of the property. So it is in fact, there are actual occupants who are in possession of the property. So he cannot avail of uh, the principle of self-help. He cannot use force in order to eject the actual occupants because, again, what does the law tell us? Uh, actual possession under claim of ownership raises disputable presumption of ownership. And anyone who wants to recover possession of the said property must, go, must resort to judicial process. You cannot invoke the principle of self-help. You cannot use force or violence uh, to uh, wrest possession from the actual occupants. Okay, people versus pledge. This is the actual application of the principle of self-help. So pledge is a farmer. Okay, he invokes self-help in defense of the land which he owns. He, uh, he fought off and prevented a corporation without any court order who was insisting to fence four hectares of his land. As a result, 
pious resistance uh, uh, and for which he was prosecuted and convicted of grave coercion. So a criminal case was filed against him. So the principle of self-help authorizes the lawful possessor to use force not only to prevent a threatened unlawful invasion or usurpation thereof. It is a sort of self-defense. It is lawful to repel force by force. He who merely uses force to defend his possession does not possess by force. The use of necessary force to protect proprietary or possessory rights constitutes a justifying circumstance. So in this case, the usurper's possession has not yet become complete and the complainants were in the act of building a fence. Such an act constitutes force in contemplation of the law. This act of trespass justified the appellant to shoo them away, even by means of a bolo, because they refused to listen to his appeal, which is reasonable. They, they refused to be generous, patient, nor compassionate. So the act of the complainant in um, showing away the ones who were constructing a fence on, on a portion of his property was justified by the Supreme Court uh, as a valid use of the principle of self-help. Okay, now we go to the limitations or restrictions on ownership. We have so far discussed the right to uh, alienate the property, the right to vindicate or recover possession of realty or personal property, which is part of the rights or attributes of ownership. Okay, as I've said, uh, every owner has an obligation or a restriction that comes with ownership of a certain property, okay? Those are enumerated under Articles 431, 432, 435, 436, and 437 as follows. The owner of the thing cannot make use thereof in such a manner as to injure the rights of third persons. So when you are the owner of a certain property, you cannot use it in order to injure the rights of third persons. In other words, you must always make use of your property in consideration and in recognition of the rights of other people. Example, when you are the owner of a uh, video okay? okay you cannot use it in the wee hours of the night or in the wee hours of the morning uh, in such uh, a high volume because it would prejudice the rights of third persons who have the right to uh, sleep at that time of the night or in the early morning Article 432, the owner of a thing has no right to prohibit the interference of another with the same if the interference is necessary to avert an imminent danger and the threatened damage compared to the damage arising to the owner from the interference is much greater. The owner may demand from the person benefited indemnity for the damage to him. Example would be a dog which appears to be uh, asong ulol, parang gano'n. Okay, uh, if uh, he is in the, uh, the dog is about to bite a certain person, a third person, then uh, another person, he is justified in killing the dog because uh, uh, the dog poses a serious and imminent damage to the person because he is in danger of being beaten. Okay? Article 435, no person shall be deprived of his property except by competent authority and for public use and always upon payment of just compensation. So this is the power of the state 
all to use the power of imminent domain or expropriation. Article 436, when any property is condemned or seized by competent authority in the interest of health, safety, or security, the owner thereof shall not be entitled to compensation unless he can show that such condemnation or seizure is unjustified. So, if, for example, if custom authorities discover that a certain package has a, a virus, okay, then uh, the government is uh, empowered to seize and dispose or destroy the said package or parcel. Okay? Article 437, the owner of a parcel of land is the owner of its surface and everything under it, and he can construct thereon any works or make any plant plantations and excavations which he may deem proper without detriment to servitudes and subject to special laws and ordinances. He cannot complain of the reasonable requirements of aerial navigation. Okay, the surface rights of owners. Okay, Lunot versus Meneses. This is the first case on restrictions and limitations of ownership. So in this case, Lunot filed a complaint against Meneses alleging that they each owned and possessed farmland situated near a small lake named Kalalakan. That the defendant is the owner of a fish pond and a strip of land situated in Paraanan. So there existed and it still exists in favor of the rice fields of the plaintiffs, a statutory easement permitting the flow of water over the said land in Paraanan which is meant the said plaintiffs enjoyed and consisted in that the water collected upon their lands and in the Kalalaran Lake could flow through Paraanan into the Taliki River. However, the defendant without any right converted the land in Paraanan into a fish pond and by means of a dam and a bamboo net prevented the free passage of the water through the said place into the Talitic River, <clears throat> that as a consequence, the land of the plaintiffs became flooded and damaged by stagnant waters, there being no outlet except through the land in Paraanan. <clears throat> he, together with his brothers, were the owners of the lot and that they had the right to construct structures and improvements including the dam. <coughs> the lands of Paraanan being the lower are subject to the easement of receiving and giving passage to the waters proceeding from the higher lands in the lake of Kalalaran. <coughs> this easement is statutory in nature. The defendant Menestes and no right to construct the works nor the dam, which blocks the passage through his lands and the outlet to the Talitic River of the waters which, the, which flood the higher lands of the plaintiffs. And having done so, to the detriment of the easement charge on his estate, he has violated the law. So even though he is the owner of the property, he cannot use it in such a manner as to prejudice the rights of others because he would block the waters that flow through uh, the said estate. It is true that Article 388 authorizes every owner to enclose his estate by means of walls, beaches, fences, or any other device, but his right is limited by the easement imposed upon his estate. The defendant Meneses might have constructed the works necessary to make and maintain a fish pond within his own land, but he was always under the strict and necessary obligation to respect the statutory easement of water. So it is a statutory easement imposed upon his property, being the Serbian estate. Okay, PND versus Telacruz. So in this case, spouses de la Cruz secured 
a loan and a security day mortgage two parcels of land to PNB. Now, PNB extrajudicially foreclosed the mortgage because the spouses defaulted in their own In extrajudicial foreclosure of mortgage, only if the debtor is in possession and no third person had intervened, such requisite is lacking in this case as it was established that private respondent Montano has been in possession and finally a judge as the tenant of the land holding in question. So, it gives the uh, Republic Act 3844, gives the agricultural lessee the right to work on the land holding once the leasehold relationship is established. So, the leasehold relation is not extinguished by the alienation or transfer of legal possession of the land holding. So the petitioner PNB was only substituted to and acquired the right title, interest, and claim of the judgment debtor or mortgagor to the property at the time of the debt. Okay, so it is a restriction which is imposed by law. So it doesn't mean that because PNB has already acquired ownership of the real Okay, there are certain restrictions or limitations which is imposed by law because of the leasehold relationship. Okay, RA 3844 gives the agricultural lessee the right to work on the land holding. And that the same must be respected by the new owner of the property, which is PNP. So it is in fact a restriction or a limitation which is imposed by law upon the owner of the property. Okay, now we go to expropriation. Okay, foremost uh, among the cases in expropriation is transfer. Okay, versus uh, am. In this case, expropriation does not automatically mean an acquisition of private property by way of sale. It may also be an acquisition of an easement of right, right of way. Okay, remember that Expropriation or eminent domain is one of the powers of the state. Okay? Every owner has the right to decide when to dispose or not to dispose his property. So, however, when the state decides to expropriate your property, even if you don't want to sell it, okay, you will be compelled or forced to sell it. Okay? That is why it is a restriction or a limitation on the right of ownership. Okay, so in the case of transfer versus act, okay, what was being expropriated by the state is not the ownership, the entire or full ownership of the property, but it only wants to acquire an easement on your property. Okay? Considering the nature and the effect of the installation of power lines, the limitations on the use of land for an indefinite period would deprive the respondent of the normal use of property. For this reason, the latter is entitled to payment of just compensation, which must be neither more nor less than the monetary equivalent of the land. Because we are here talking of transmission lines, okay? If you see a transmission line, especially those which are uh, built on, on farmlands, agricultural lands, okay, the the owner of the farmland can still use the the land beneath the line. Okay, so what Transco acquired there is not not the ownership of the land itself, but it only imposed an easement okay, on the property. Because instead of uh, the owner of the land has the right to everything which is underneath and everything above his property. But because there are transmission lines on the property, you can only, uh, your, your use of the land has been limited. Okay? And that is what the government acquired. The acquisition of an easement of right of way over the property. Okay.
Ate Acosta versus Ochoa speaks of the right to bear arms. Okay? If you are the owner of a firearm, does it mean that you can do anything with it? Okay, or are there limitations or restrictions which are imposed by law on your property? Okay, the answer is uh, in Acosta versus Ochoa. Okay, the license to possess a firearm is not property. There is no vested right in the continued ownership and possession of firearms. Property rights are always subject to the state's police power, defined as the authority to enact legislation that may interfere with personal liberty or property in order to promote the general welfare. Uh, in this case, uh, the court found that the PNP, which suspended the issuance of permits to carry firearms, was a valid police power measure. So in this case, uh, it is a recognition of police power as well as the laws which are imposed by the government uh, with respect to the right of citizens to bear arms. Okay, so that is a restriction or a limitation on the right of ownership. Castro versus Monsod. Okay, so petitioners and the respondents are adjoining owners of lots located in different but adjacent subdivisions. So the respondent caused the annotation of an adverse claim against the property of the petitioner without any claim of ownership, but only for the purpose of recognizing the easement of lateral and subjacent support. Okay, because these properties are not uh, at the same level. The property of one is lower than the property of the other. Although they are located in adjacent subdivision. So whether the easement of lateral and subjacent support exists on the subject adjacent properties and whether the same may be annotated at the back of the title of the Serbian estate. Article 684 of the Civil Code provides that no proprietor shall make such excavations upon his land as to deprive any adjacent land of sufficient lateral or subjacent support. An owner, by virtue of his surface right, may make excavations on his land, but his right is subject to the limitation that he shall not deprive any adjacent land of sufficient lateral or subjacent support. Between two adjacent landowners, each has an absolute property right to have his land laterally supported by the soil of his neighbor. And if, if in excavating on his own premises, he disturbs the lateral support of his neighbor's land as to cause it on, or in its natural state by the pressure of its own weight to fall away or slide from its position, the one so excavating is liable. Okay, so in this case, this case the uh, Supreme Court recognized the existence of an easement of subjacent and lateral support in favor of the respondent. However, the Supreme Court said that annotation of that easement is not necessary. It exists whether or not it is annotated in the property. A judicial recognition of the same already binds the property and the owner of the same, including her successors in interest. Otherwise, Every adjoining landowner would come to court or have the easement of lateral and subjacent support registered in their title. Okay, so it exists as a matter of law and it exists as a statutory easement, the easement of lateral and subjacent support. It is a restriction or a limitation, again, imposed by law on every property owner. Okay? It need not be registered. Republic versus Court of Appeals. Okay, so this is a case uh, arising from an application for registration of a parcel of land 
filed by De La Rosa, the state opposed the application for registration on the ground that they are mineral lands. Okay, the subject property was considered as forest land and included in the Cordillera Forest Reserve. But this did not impair the rights already vested in Benguet and Atom at that time. Because as uh, you all know, um, every owner of a parcel of land is the owner of everything underneath the said parcel of land as well as everything which is above the said parcel of land, except when there are minerals. Because if there are minerals, the minerals found underneath do not belong to the owner of the surface, but said minerals belong to the state as part of the jura regalia or the regalia doctrine. Uh, however, the perfection of the mining claim converted the property to mineral land and under the laws it then in force removed it from the public domain. By such act, the locators acquired exclusive rights over the land, even against the government, without need of any further act, such as the purchase of land or the obtention of a patent over it. So they, they already have a vested right over the said minerals. Because at that time, and the laws prevailing at that time, they have already perfected okay, their mining claim. And therefore, they are entitled to the said minerals. Okay? Uh, the rights over the land are indivisible and that the land itself cannot be half agricultural and half mineral. The classification must be categorical. The land must be either completely mineral or completely agricultural. In this case, the land which was originally classified as forest ceased to be so and became mineral and completely mineral once the mining claims were perfected. As long as the mining operations were being undertaken, it did not cease to be so and become agricultural, even if only partly so because it was enclosed with a fence and was cultivated by those who were unlawfully occupying the surface. Thus, if a person is the owner of agricultural land in which minerals are discovered, his ownership of such land does not give him the right to extract or utilize the said minerals without the permission of the state to which such minerals belong. Once minerals are discovered in the land, whatever the use to which it is being devoted, such use may be discontinued by the state to enable it to extract the minerals. Uh, the land is thus converted to mineral land and may not be used by any private party, including the registered owner, for any other purpose. Our holding is that Benguet and Atok have exclusive rights to the property by virtue of their respective mining claims, which they validly acquired before the Constitution of 1935 prohibited the alienation of all lands of the public domain except agricultural land, subject to vested right existing at the time of its adoption. Okay, now we go to hidden treasure. Who is the owner of hidden treasure? Okay, first, what is hidden treasure? Hidden treasure is understood as any hidden and unknown deposit of money, jewelry, or other precious objects, the lawful ownership of which does not apply. Okay, so that is very important. Okay, the lawful ownership of which does not appear. Because if there is any indication of ownership, okay, that is not considered as a hidden treasure, then there is an obligation on the part of the finder or the owner of the property on which the said treasure is found to return it to its lawful owner. A hidden treasure belongs to the owner of the land building or other property on which it is found. Why? Because it is part of your surface rights. If it is found underneath or anywhere in your property, if you are the owner of the surface, you are also the owner of everything underneath. So everything which is found on your property, hidden treasures included, okay, will belong to the owner of the land. However, if it is found 
okay on uh, by another person okay uh, or when it is found on the property of the state by another person and by chance or with the permission of the owner okay they shall divide it in half half thereof belongs to the finder half thereof belongs to the owner However, if it is found by the trust, by a trust, passer, meaning one who is not authorized, he shall not be entitled to any share of the treasure. What if it is found by the lessee or the use of fracture? Because he has the right to be in the property, he, it is uh, presumed that it is also authorized by the owner. So he is entitled again to a half, and the owner is entitled to half of the hidden treasure. Okay, so it is a form of a forced co-ownership. Okay, when hidden treasure is found by chance or with the permission of the owner. Okay, it is part exercise of the surface rights of the owner. So that ends the lecture on ownership.